lot of people ask me about what do the bees do this time of year? Do they hibernate over the winter? No, they don't. I'm going to take a few minutes and explain to you just what happens inside the hive during the winter. It feels like spring today, but we're actually just getting into winter. It's 60 degrees out here today and hard to believe that just over a week ago we had our big cold spell, but I'm not going to complain about the warm weather today and neither are the bees. You might already know that honeybees, like other insects, are cold-blooded. And that means that when their body temperature cools down, their activity slows way down and they go into a state that's called torpor. And torpor is just a state of reduced activity due to the reduced temperature. Now, because honeybees are cold-blooded, their bodies don't react the way that we warm-blooded creatures do. And we often think of getting cold as a life-threatening thing. And it is for us. As our bodies get cold, we go into hypothermia, and that can become life-threatening. And ultimately, if our body temperatures fall too low, then our body functions will cease. For a cold-blooded organism like a honeybee, as they cool down, their motion will slow down and cease, but it's not necessarily life-threatening for them unless they actually physically freeze. Once ice crystals form in their blood, then they'll die. While an individual honeybee is cold-blooded, the organism itself needs to maintain a certain minimum temperature. During the spring and summer when the colony is producing brood, they need to maintain a temperature of about 95 degrees. And they can do that by either warming up the inside of the hive or cooling it down through ventilation and the use of water. During the winter, they aren't typically producing brood like they are during other parts of the year. And because of that, they don't need to maintain that high of a temperature. But they do want to maintain a temperature of the colony of about 55 to 60 degrees at a minimum to protect the queen. The way they do that is to form a cluster. The bees inside of the colony, when the temperature drops below 50 degrees, will form into a ball. And that ball will go across the frames or the beehive comb in the case of a natural hive. Now, to condense that ball as much as possible, the bees will go inside of empty cells, they'll compact themselves together with the queen at the middle and the oldest bees at the outside. And within that cluster, the bees will vibrate their wing muscles to generate heat. Just like you and I, when we are exercising, will produce heat, the bees produce heat as well and they use that heat to maintain a minimum temperature of that cluster. So they never really hibernate. They never go into a group state of torpor, but instead they stay together and work together to maintain that minimum temperature. Now the bees will break cluster when the weather warms up to typically above about 50 degrees and on a day like today, and they will fly out to do what's called cleansing flights. To put it quite bluntly, what they're doing is going out to relieve themselves. What I think is interesting is that as I watch my hives during the day and look for activity on these warm days just to confirm which hives are still doing okay, those cleansing flights will be like a sudden rush. The bees all tend to go out all at the same time and it really makes sense because the worker bees are all female. I imagine that on the inside of the hive one of those female worker bees says, hey girls, I gotta go and they all just get up and go to the bathroom together. Now there are a few factors which are particular risks to the bees and their survival over winter. A short list of these, and this doesn't list every possible risk, but the ones I'm most concerned about are starvation, excess moisture, temperature swings, and a weak hive. Over the winter, as the bees are in that cluster and vibrating to keep everybody warm, they're going to be using up calories. And to replace those calories, they're going to need to eat honey. Now, they maintain that tight cluster. They don't, aren't going out foraging. There's not really any nectar to forage anyway. And they don't go across frames. In other words, you've got your frames that the bees make their cluster around. If they've got honey on other frames or other comb farther out, in order to get to that, they would have to break that cluster apart to go around those combs. Well, to do that, they would lose all the heat that they're trying to retain. 
so they typically don't break cluster as long as there's cold temperatures. Instead, that cluster will move vertically on those frames and consume the honey at the top of the frames, or that's above the bees, as they move up. So it's my job in late fall, as I prepare the hives for winter, to make sure that they have plenty of honey at the top of the frames and also honey on the end frames, those ones that they won't use during the cold, but that honey is there for the springtime. As for the excess moisture, I'm going to tell you something that is contrary to what a lot of other beekeepers will say, and that's that the moisture inside the hive doesn't kill the bees. This time of year, a lot of beekeepers are concerned about moisture inside the hives and what they can do to mitigate it. The moisture in the hive is a natural byproduct of the bees consuming honey and using up those calories. Now, having that moisture in the hives itself is not a danger. What is a danger is where that moisture might condense. If that moisture is condensing on the lid of the hive above the bees, and then that water is dripping down onto that cluster and causing it to cool down, then it becomes a danger factor. Our third factor, temperature swings, is something the bees can deal with as long as it's not too sudden. We have a day like today when it's 60 degrees, you can see the bees are out flying around. But if our temperature suddenly dropped, we got a sudden cold front and the temperature dropped, well those bees that are out flying around are not going to have time to get back to their cluster. Even within the hive, if the temperature were to swing suddenly, those bees might not get back into the cluster before they go into that state of torpor and aren't able to get to the cluster. And the fewer bees are able to get back into the cluster, the harder it's going to be for them to maintain a minimum temperature for that cluster overall. And that kind of brings us to our final factor, which is a weak colony. If you go into winter with a colony that has very few bees, that colony has a very low risk of being able to survive in their cluster over winter. Winter bees do live longer than summer bees. During the summer, a worker bee has a lifespan of about 45 days. If the bees that were in the hive now lived only 45 days, there is no hive that would live through a winter, at least not in our climate. Even though these winter bees are not as active and have, don't wear themselves out as fast and so have a longer lifespan, there are still bees that die every day. And as the population within the hive gets smaller and smaller, you're going to reach a point to where there's not enough to maintain the temperature for, to protect the colony overall. So if you go into winter with a very small number of bees, a very weak hive, then their chances of surviving are very low. So what can I as a beekeeper do to mitigate these risk factors? As I prepare my hives for winter, I try to consider how bees overwinter in the wild. Dr. Thomas Seeley's research has identified certain characteristics of a hive that bees prefer, such as a relatively small cavity, which is enclosed, snug, and not drafty, with an entrance hole near the bottom. A hollow tree cavity will also typically have thick wooden walls, providing good thermal mass for insulation. And this is part of the reason why I prefer the Layens hives. This, for example, is an insulated hive, which has walls that are about an inch and a half thick. So plywood on each side, and then a layer, about an inch and a half layer of insulation in between. In the case of this hive, it uses sheep's wool, and that provides an R factor of about seven. This is in comparison to the three quarter inch walls of a typical Langstroth hive, which has an R factor of about one. The bees do not have to heat the entire cavity. They only need to maintain heat within their cluster. I think it stands to reason that the less the temperature fluctuates within the cavity overall, the easier the bees will have it keeping their cluster warm. I try to minimize the space the bees have available as much as possible at the end of the year. So in this Layens hive, I consolidate the space down to the number of the frames the bees really need to overwinter. And I've described this in other videos. I won't go into too much detail here, but basically I want brood frames that have about three to five inches of honey at the top of them and then a full frame of honey at each end. With no excess frames and a follower board on the end that defines that cavity space. So although this is a 20 frame hive, the bees only have a few frames that they're overwintering on. 
And then on top of those frames, I put an insulated pillow. What that pillow does is it helps to keep the heat from escaping through the top. It maintains that heat within, and it also helps to minimize the possibility of any condensation happening just above the bees. The less the bees have to work to maintain the heat within their cluster, the less honey they're going to consume. So by having a relatively small consolidated space that's insulated, we check a lot of those risk factor boxes. We minimize the heat fluctuations within the hive. We minimize honey consumption, so reduce the possibility of starve out. We minimize the possibility of that moisture from condensing above the bees and dripping down on them. And as far as starting out with a weak hive, that we have to take care of in the fall. This is how I manage this within the Layens hive. I want to show you what I've done for my Langstroth hive. There's a great debate among beekeepers about whether it's necessary to wrap or insulate your hives. A lot of beekeepers say they don't do it, their bees have done fine, and I say more power to them. I don't want anybody's bees to die. And if your bees are surviving, doing what you're doing, that's great. But I think a lot of that is going to be regional. And I base my decisions on how I prepare my hives for winter on the factors I already described. So I kind of try to replicate that. The thick walls, the well-insulated space, and the moisture management I talked about. So a lot of the things I try to do in my Layens hive, I try to replicate in the Langstroth. And so what I've done in this case, I have a spacer on top of the hive. It's about a three inch spacer and I have insulation in that. Underneath that is a sheet of fabric. And so that will help with the possible issue of condensation above the bees. To help with minimizing heat swings, I also wrap the entire hive in this pink insulation board. A lot of beekeepers will put a vent at the top to help vent out the humid air. I don't think the moisture is so much of a problem that you have to vent it out as long as you keep it from condensing and dripping down on the bees. And I don't want that upper ventilation so that the bees will be losing that heat directly out the top of the hive. So I don't do that. In fact, you can see I have this taped shut and that's not to hermetically seal the hive per se. It's more a factor of wanting snow and rain to be able to run off instead of going back behind that foam insulation. I have wrapped this hive based on my best presumptions about how I can simulate a wild hive within this Langstroth hive. It's a little bit experimental and it's contrary to what a lot of beekeepers would do. So we'll see in the spring how it turns out. So that's a quick rundown of what happens in the hives over winter. If you found this interesting and like this video, I appreciate if you would like this video. And if you wanna see similar videos in the future, go ahead and click on that subscribe button and don't forget to click on the bell icon so you don't miss a single video. In the meantime, Go ahead and check out this video that Google has selected especially for you. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.